Oh, look at this. And look at the tour of golf cart. This is a net for rockfish, or as some people call them, striped bass. And let's go over here and look at this rug here, 1758, April 12, 1776. During the Revolution, Halifax was a supply depot for the state militia and Continental Army, a district recruiting office for the Continental Army, headquarters for a battalion of Minutemen, and site of the General Armaments Factory. Willie Jones is a politician. The North Carolina Provisional Congress meeting in Halifax on April 12, 1776, voted to empower its delegates in Philadelphia's Continental Congress to concur with delegates with other colonies declaring the independency. William R. Davy. He's the founder of the University of North Carolina. Alan Jones, home at Mount Gallant in Northampton County, attracted those Federalists who were the political opponents of Alan's brother Willie. Joseph Montford. So, Bannistry Tarleton was with Gordon Wallace and his badly behaving troops behaved so badly, two were hanged. And this display says it all, peanuts, cotton, tobacco, corn, soybeans. The town of Halifax was the commercial and political center of the Roanoke Valley. Several important events. Halifax served as a trading center for much of the Roanoke Valley. Timber, furs, crops collected from the countryside were exchanged for finished goods from Europe. The West Indies and other American colonies. Hoof, foot, and flatboat. Eastern North Carolina about 1790. Orlock, Spurs, Conestoga Ho, Cagat Canoe, Spice Cope, Stirrups, 
Walking was the most common form. Horseback. Riding a horse was the first choice of most travelers. Look at it, pulling a hogshead with horses. Carts and wagons. Two wheel carts were the most common working vehicle in the colony. Water transportation. The sloop. the schooner, and the brig, the canoe, and the flatboat, travel. Most early travel in the Roanoke Valley was done by water, the Roanoke and its tributaries forming the basis of a system for moving people and goods. But as the population pushed into the western part of the state, land routes supplemented by bridges and ferries became more important than waterways. The road system that soon developed connected Halifax with the valley and the coast, the back country with and with Virginia. In the early days of the American Revolution, the rebellious colonies began holding provincial congresses. These organizations started out as groups of men who got together to give their, air their grievances with, against the British crown. As the revolution progressed, the provincial congresses gradually became the governments of the colonies. In September 1774, the provincial congresses of the 13 colonies met and elected delegates to a Continental Congress, which met in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The 4th Provincial Congress of North Carolina met in Halifax on April 4th to May the 15th, 1776. 83 delegate delegates came from counties and towns all over the colony. On April 12th, they unanimously approved of the Halifax Resolves. This document directed the North Carolina delegates in Philadelphia to vote for independence from Great Britain. North Carolina thereby became the first colony to take official action towards independence. In November and December 1776, the first provincial congress also met in Halifax. During the session, the delegates wrote North Carolina's first state Education. There were more than 30 schools and academies in the Roanoke Valley from 1800 to 1840. There was no public education system. The proper method of establishing a common school was for several parents in the town or county to pool their money to hire a teacher. George Moses Horton, he was an enslaved member of the community. A.M.E. African Methodist Episcopal. St. Luke's. St. Luke's Episcopal AME Church. Look at the bench. It's hard to read. This says slavery in Halifax County. The slaves comprised one third of North Carolina's population in 1830. Eastern counties such as Halifax had the highest concentration of enslaved people. I guess that's a hoe cake. No, it says Cush, Cornmill.
Cush, family life. Difficult for slaves to maintain their family lives. Urban slaves worked in their owners' houses, were held in higher esteem by whites. Much of the skilled labor made Halifax County a thriving town. Plantation slavery ensured many physical and emotional hardships endured at the plantations. The overseer woke the slaves with a bell or horn before dawn. Anyways, every year thousands of enslaved blacks ran away from their masters or tried to. The slaves ran away because they had been separated from their families, had been assigned brutally heavy workloads, or heard they were going to be sold. Often the reason for running was simply to gain a temporary relief from bondage. Many risked severe punishment for a small taste of freedom. Rest for the day, 1776. Clothing in the 18th century, as today, was a status symbol. Upper class dress reflected wealth and freedom from manual labor through form fitting styles and rich fabrics. Garments of the working and slave classes were made of coarser, cheaper fabrics cut in fuller styles. Dress in 1776, Halifax mirrored the diversity of the population. A gentry woman. And the slave male. A minute man. Currency. Three months before the adoption of the Declaration of Independence, Halifax County authorized $1,250,000 to prepare colonial defenses against Britain. During the federal period, North Carolina banknotes were issued by private banks and by the State of North Bank of North Carolina. North Carolina colonial currency was issued for the first time in 1712 to pay for the colony's defense against the Tuscarora Indians. The notes were actually bills of credit. Since there was no specie to support them, specie being a metal, a coin, usually silver or gold, it full of cones. Here's a... What is this? Corn shaker? Containers. Unlike disposable materials used in most containers today, containers in the 18th century and early 19th centuries were constructed of wood, iron, glass, and pottery. Such containers were found in homes, stores, shops, and warehouses, and ranged in size from small medicine vials to huge tobacco hogsheads. The town of Halifax was formed by merchants who recognized the natural trade advantages of the location. The town was appropriately named for the head of the British Board of Trade, the Earl of Halifax. Within a few years of its founding in 1759, Halifax had more than 50 houses and stores, a courthouse, a jail, and several warehouses. The town quickly became the commercial center of the valley. Both land and river commerce intersected at Halifax, which also became the political center of the valley. Milliners, woodworkers, leather workers, metal workers, and other skilled craftsmen living in the towns of Roanoke Valley supplied many of the everyday items for valley residences. European, these craftsmen followed the European tradition of apprenticeship and their training was often the only education available to young men. The apprenticeship system provided a means of 
keeping orphans and delinquents off the state's poor rolls. George Moses Horton. He was considered a genius in his time, learning to read and write against great odds. He read of classical literature, lectured to students at the University of North Carolina, and published. It was a published poet. His knowledge and vocabulary increased. He began composing poetry. By the 1820s, he made Sabbath walks to the nearby University of North Carolina Chapel Hill to sell poems and fruit. He used income from selling students love poems and doing handyman work for the university he pay his owner in lieu of service. University President Joseph Caldwell encouraged him and local newspapers eventually published several of his poems. Here's one of his poems. Another one. 